This is my second video reporting on the last round of the World Junior, uh, which took place in Mexico City. It's all over now. So if you remember, there were two players showing the lead going to the last round, Marc-Andrea Morizzi and Luka Budisavljevic. They drew their game, so that meant that others, if they won, could catch them up. And we saw that Arseniy Nesterov defeated Hans Niemann. Really interesting game. Uh, do check out my other video if you want to have a look at that. And now I'd like to look at another of the games where if one of them won, they could catch the leaders. So here we go. It's Frederick Svana playing white against Mamikon Garibian. So Svana representing Germany and Garibian representing Armenia. So the name Svana might be familiar to you. His brother, Rasmus Svana, has already made great strides in, in the chess world. And uh, it looks like his younger brother, Frederick Svana, quite a bit younger. I think uh, Rasmus is 26. And uh, Frederick Svana is 19 years old, but already rated well over 2,600. And, and in fact, was, well, one of the, the favourites to win the tournament. But... Uh, but anyway, let's see if he can get to the top by winning this last round game. I find this opening very interesting. And it's, um, it shows what happens if one of the players just doesn't quite get it right. And the other manages to find um, get go into the middle game with confidence, having had a decent opening. Knight f3, knight c6. So it's a Sicilian. And who knows which variation uh, Garibian would go for if white goes for the open with d4. Maybe a Sveshnikov, maybe a Kalashnikov. Who knows? But Svana did a tricky little move order, knight c3. Now, I covered this in my anti-Sicilians course uh, on chessable. Um, for strict Kalashnikov players, this poses something of a problem because if you make a move like, well, g6, then white will play d4 and, and now you're in a dragon variation. Or if, let's say, d6, then again, white goes for an open Sicilian and no Kalashnikov is possible. So what does black do? Well, e5. And I think this is actually quite a decent continuation. But it changes the nature of the position completely. We're not going to get an open Sicilian now. It's very strategic. It's very tight, um, particularly for these first few moves. In fact, well, this whole game is uh, is very tense because of this these locked pawn structures. So bishop c4, logical. The bishop claims a really good diagonal and claim some control over d5 as well. Now, black has to be switched on. Don't play the normal knight f6, because then knight g5 is already, uh, well, catastrophic for black, actually. So, bishop e7 first. d3, and again, just wait with d6. And the normal move here is, is castles. Um... And yeah, then knight f6 and so on. And black is okay there. I mean, in some ways, it's quite similar to a, a Kalashnikov or a Sveshnikov because black has to fight for control over that d5 square. The themes are actually rather similar. But in any case, white played instead a4. So delaying castling. And sometimes that can be significant. You know, you might be able to push the h pawn. Um, for, for a quick attack if black castles too quickly. Um, but instead of playing the, the normal knight f6, Garibian played h6. So normally I don't like these little pawn moves at the side of the board. You know, it feels so slow. Um, but it's in this case, I don't think it's too bad. I mean, if, if you play knight f6 straight away, then... This is a possible idea with bishop g5 um, going for, for control over d5 very quickly. 
Although I think personally, I think black is absolutely fine there. But I don't think h6 is so bad because the position is closed. Black can get away with these rather time-consuming little moves. H3. Well, this one, frankly, I really don't like. <laughs> um, white sets off on a plan here, which I think just isn't really very good. Uh, I think a normal move like knight d5 uh, would would be stronger. Um, anyway, h3 played, knight f6, normal move. Now black gets on with development. So knight h2, this is white's idea. So coming in to g4, knocking this... Whoops, I didn't mean to play it. Um, yeah, knocking the knight on f6 out and then gaining greater control over the d5 square. But black, I think, replies to this extremely well. It's a very nice move. Knight b4. And again... I know this idea from uh, Sicilian positions, from the Kalashnikov, the Sveshnikov, from the Nidorf. If white has already played a4, then this knight can often come to b4 rather than d4, and you fight for control over the d5 square. And also you're looking at c2, which just prevents the, the queen from moving. So yeah, that's a consequence of white playing a4 at a very early stage, this knight b4 move. It's a, it's a useful move. And now if white were to play knight g4, that could be exchanged. And then bishop g5 I like. Um, and if black's queen, often exchange, comes to g5, then that looks very nice. So white goes back into normal mode and plays castles kingside and black having seen that white has castled, now it's safe to castle as well. And I feel that knight on h2 just isn't really doing very much. Rook e1 played. I mean, maybe this knight is is, is looking to sort of flip around via f1 to, to, to e3 or g3, but after this move, um, I think black is absolutely fine. Once again, this is the kind of standard move in the Kalashnikov and the Sveshnikov and the Nidorf, these open Sicilians where you have this backward d pawn. Black is fighting for control over d5, and you're just not worried about bishop takes bishop, as, as we're going to see. Now, I, I think white should probably uh, redeploy this knight. here. But instead, white takes on e6. I think white was just kind of thrown by black's play. And after this exchange, I just don't think black has any difficulties at all. That pawn covers d5, so you never have to worry about a knight coming in here. Not that there was a chance of that anyway with these knights. But it also opens the f-file, and that could well be a source of play for black. I think white's problem is I'm not sure where white is playing in this position. So let's see how this, this panned out. So knight e2, knight c6. Yeah, I mean, the knight has done its job on b4. It's going to be pushed anyway with c3. And I, I, I mean, I do think that white should get on with, with c3. Um, anyway, knight g3 played. So I'm not quite sure where this knight is, is going. Queen e8. Yep. The queen sits nicely on the king side. Doubling on the f-file. There's a little bit of pressure there. Not that I think this is too serious, but it just, you know, keeps white honest, you could say. And now I think white should simply bring that knight back to f3. Just block the f-file. It's a decent square. Um, and then potentially later on either play for d4 or or maybe go for b4 uh, at some point. But queen e2, I don't know, I'm not, 
I understand it. It it protects the F2 pool. But I'm not sure what White's plan is. Knight h7. Knight f3. Yep, so blocks the f file. And now a5. Yeah, incidentally, of course, if White had played this, then after the exchange, whoop, seems I can't take that, then the knight comes in. Okay, that's, that's very unpleasant. So that's why the knight came back to f3, but I think it should have come back earlier. And now a5. So black is just saying, okay, I don't want any pawn breaks. b4 has been prevented. d4 isn't possible at the moment. And what's white playing? If, if, you, if white doesn't have a pawn break, then actually there's not a lot to do in this position because the pieces certainly can't be manoeuvred to, to better squares. Rook a3, well, that's a little bit risky. I understand the rook wants to, to come to b3 and sort of press on b7, but b7 can be defended very easily. And now black takes the initiative. D5. So just feels like black is claiming a space advantage here, and there's not a lot that white has to compensate that. So, yeah, I think Svana was thrown by the opening, and uh, Garibian just handled it a lot better. So let's see how things worked out. Rook B3. I'm Well, the, the computer thinks this is somehow okay. I'm not convinced by this. It doesn't feel right, um, and I think... Yeah, Garibian with black plays this extremely well. I like this maneuver. The bishop comes round. B6, so that just shuts out the rook completely. And in any case, that bishop is going to stand very well on c7. So you can see that white is just running out of ideas. King h1, I don't really know what that's about. Bishop c7, excellent move. So it protects the pawn here. Also, protects e5, make sure that f4 is never happening. And you never know, that bishop might, if the position opens, actually come into play. Rook a3, so white thinks better of this uh, manoeuvre, um, but it's gone badly wrong, because after this exchange, rook there, and suddenly massive problems with that pawn on d3. Um, I mean, c4 would protect it but it looks absolutely miserable considering that black can can throw the knight into one of these squares which is better probably i'd probably go for knight b4 which i guess would force an exchange i mean this looks absolutely terrible and then both recaptures are good actually probably that one and well a protected pass pawn and then you can gang up on the a pawn it looks absolutely miserable for white Again, where is white to counterplay? Um, bishop c1 played, and rook takes d3. Well, the reason that Svana did this, or, or should I say allowed this, was to play knight d4, which breaks the communication between the rooks. But there's a very natural and very simple exchange sacrifice. Pawn takes, and knight e5. So, yeah. The position has opened up. That bishop is in the game. Um, but well, look at this. So what's what's the material count? It's actually black has a knight and a pawn for a rook. So a little bit behind in material, but wow. Positionally just killing it here. Beautiful pass pawn on d3, and that knight. About to enter that, whoops, arrow, arrow incorrect, that beautiful square on c4. And yeah, what's that knight doing on h2? Nothing. Knight c4. Yeah, this is miserable. I mean, yep, we've got another case of the good old split rooks, which I'm afraid is just indicative of the problems that white has in this position. The coordination is just appalling. Rook d1. Well, d2 was threatened. Um, knight takes pawn. 
So white decides to give back some material. Knight g3 check. Lots of nice pins there. So that has to be taken with the rook. And the bishop captures. And yes, if pawn takes bishop, then you're going to take... And that really doesn't look very good for white. Uh, once black recaptures the minor piece, and that knight on c4 is just going to guarantee a win, basically. Uh, unless I've overlooked something better, but I, don't, I think that seems correct. So queen takes c4, rook check, knight blocks, and rook takes bishop. So still a nice pin on the f-file. Um, pawn takes... Obviously, that can be taken. Well, let's just have a quick look at that. Pawn takes bishop. White could reach a rook and pawn endgame, a pawn down. Um, any drawing chances? Not really. The king will protect the e-pawn. The king will come into the middle. And this rook is, is very active. Active rook. Extra pawn. White king is terrible must be losing. So instead of that, Svana played king g1, protecting f2. Bishop e5, that's a nice move, hitting that pawn. So black is a pawn up with excellent pieces. Is that two pawns? That looks like two pawns now. Yeah, I mean, white is just going through the motions here. This isn't a lot of fun. We'll just zip through to the end fairly quickly. And that was the final move. So that is pawn number three. And if queen takes bishop, then rook takes knight. So yeah, white has absolutely nothing there. Lost position. I really like the way that uh, Garibian played that. This move, knight b4, really important, fighting for control over d5. And, well, the classic move, bishop b6, and I don't think black has any difficulties at all. And, yes, yeah, Svana just ran out of ideas. Um, a, a tough one to play. I can imagine that he would have felt after that game he just didn't give the best account of himself. So that win meant that Garibian joined... Moritzi Nesterov and Budisavljevich on eight and a half. Four players on eight and a half. Yeah, there was another player who could possibly um, tie for first as well. That was Jan Subel, but he only drew. So four players, Moritzi Nesterov, Budisavljevich and Garubian on eight and a half. But on tie break, Marc-Andrea Moritzi from France took it. Uh, so... Well, well done to him. He had been at the top of the tournament all the way through. So, well deserved, I would say. Um, I believe he's only 16 years old. Let me just check that. One second. Or is he 17? No, he's 16, 16 years old. Um so a great prospect for the future. Um, is he as good as lots of the, for example, the Indian kids um, who are in their teens are already reaching 2,700? Well, time will tell. But anyway, a very worthy winner. So well done to him. And yeah, I've, I found a lot of the games really very interesting. I hope you did too. Thanks very much for watching.